Welcome to Uncommon Core, where we explore the big ideas in crypto from first principles. This show is hosted by Su Zhu, the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Three Arrows Capital, and me, Hasu, a crypto researcher and writer. Hey, welcome to the show, Su. Hey, Hasu. Our guest today is Kyle Samani, the general partner at Multicoin Capital, and our topic is the two major ways to scale a layer one blockchain um, and really like how much decentralization is the winning blockchain going to have. Um, before we dive into this, um, Kai, can you give us a quick intro, uh, both of yourself and also um, of sort of Multicoin and your approach to investing and sort of your time horizon so we can, you know, get some context on like your portfolio and so on. Sure. So um, hi, everyone. I'm a pleasure to be on the show. Long time listener. Uncommon Core is one of my favorite podcasts, and we all do a, a great job unpacking the fun, uh, fun media debates. Um, so I launched Multicoin um, in October of 2017, uh, along with my co-founder Tushar. Um, we, in 2017, launched our, our hedge fund. Um, we added our first venture fund in July of 18. That fund is fully deployed. We're now deploying out of our second venture fund. Um, today, we manage a few billion across those vehicles. Um, And um, we invest in you know all things crypto. Um, our our strategy is pretty straightforward. Um, we are a fundamental focused uh, fund. Our our time horizon in our hedge fund is measured in six to 24 months typically. Um, is when we kind of put on positions on that that time frame. M many things we own, like Solana, for example, which we'll talk about today. Our time horizon is longer than that, but you know at minimum we kind of have to underwrite it to six to 24 months. And our venture funds are obviously buy and hold for you know five to ten years. Um, we generally, in terms of kind of thesis formation and, and what we invest in, we've invested kind of at every layer of the stack, all the way from kind of core technical primitives through core financial primitives through middleware, um, and all the way through applications. Um, we are generally comfortable with all forms of risk, so technical risk, product risk, timing risk, um, all kind of the team risk, whatever. Um, I, I can think of probably deals where we've had serious risk in at least one of those categories. Um, we generally get more uncomfortable when you've got two or three of those that are compounding. Um, but in fact, some of the, the best returns are the ones where you, in fact, compound those risks. And so um, on rare occasions, we will kind of you know, compound those risks. But we prefer to say we're really underwriting one specific form of risk that we, we think is the core question at hand. Um, and then try not to compound too many other forms of risk. Uh, and now again, it's, it's always impossible to do that perfectly. Um, the world is not that, that neatly cut up. Um, but that's usually how we like to think about risk. Interesting. Do you have an example for like something that you would define as a risk and that you would try to avoid to compound? Y yeah. So, um, for example, like we invested in, um, Zero knowledge stuff. Um, so we invested in, in Mina, invest, invested in Starkware, um, and we've invested in both of those since 2018. And um, we came to the conclusion again. I was kind of as I was looking at zero knowledge. I was like, okay, that you can replicate, or you, rather, you can prove to someone that you've done a computation, right, and, and demonstrate the integrity of the computation you did mm -hmm. without them having to redo the computation. Um, and if you look at blockchains, the way blockchains handle this problem is simply through redundancy um, and just replication. Just have as many people replicate the same thing over and over and over. Um, and, and so zero knowledge kind of, in a, in a very abstract sense, represents one of the most disruptive kind of just fundamental changes to the nature of, of trust minimization that, that out, is out there. Um, in 2018, we looked at Starkware and Coda, which were the two kind of really only credible zero knowledge plays. And, and Starkware and, and Mina are very different things by all accounts. And we said, look, the, this is... If anything is ever going to kill crypto, it's probably this. Um, our ability to reason about layer one versus layer two at that time was almost non-existent. Um, thinking about, you know, the, the, like zero knowledge programming environments and those things, we, we had no idea how to reason about any of these things. Um, but we said, okay, look, uh, there's a real good chance zero knowledge can kind of just break all assumptions we have right now. Um, we, went, we had invested in both of those things at that time. Um, Where, where our biggest risk in our mind was timing. Um, I had a pretty strong suspicion that has borne out, I think mostly correctly, that it was too early at the time. Um, but we said, we underwrote that saying, we don't care that we're too early. 
Um, mm-hmm. Because in the event that we're, we're wrong and it's not too early, like this can just have crazy impacts through the rest of our portfolio. And so it's both a hedge on the rest of our portfolio and in and of itself kind of an asymmetric opportunity. Um, and so like the biggest risk there was timing. Um, we didn't, weren't worried about team or, or math or anything else. Like those guys are the world's expert in this stuff, right? Like we're, we're not going to um, underwrite correctness there. Our biggest question was, is zero knowledge three to seven years too early? Um, I, I personally kind of experienced that pain of being too early with my last startup, um, which was called Pristine. We built software for Google Glass um, for surgeons. Um, and in, in hindsight, it's been eight years since Google Glass launched. It was 2013. Um, and like, it was obvious, it's obvious now that it was too early. The hardware mm-hmm. just wasn't there. And like, if you look at the Snapchat summit they just had like a few days ago, um, like it's clear that it's still too early. Um, like the stuff still doesn't really work. Um, in a consumer friendly package. And, and so, you know, I spent two and a half years of my life doing something that was at least eight years too early, probably 12 years too early. Um, and I looked at, I remember, I remember looking at Zero Knowledge in 2018, thinking the same thing, thinking, okay, is this too early? And I was like, I think probably 85, 90% probability it is too early. Um, but we went ahead and pulled the trigger anyways. Makes sense. And this also brings us to sort of the question of today and that's basically will the winning blockchain scale in layers and logical sharding or rather horizontally within a single shard um and the first of those sort of breaks you know the sort of nice synchronous composability that we are used to where all applications can interact with each other atomically but it has the major benefit that users only have to verify sort of that small block of the state that they care about and in the second approach, so you keep the entire state in one huge blob, and this retains the nice composability that we have gotten used to, but at the expense of ballooning sort of the verification costs for users. And I, I've, I had a pretty, or I used to have a pretty strong, strong stance on this, and I, I would say that I still have. But I mean, sort of reading, um, you know, some of your work um, and seeing the early success of Solana has made me wonder if i am personally diversified enough on this like as you said maybe like is my risk in this area too compounded that you know maybe there's more than one approach so where do you stand on this question yeah so one quick clarification i want to make on the your comment about the users on the um, layered approach being able to verify the part of the state they care about um i'm not sure that's strictly true even in kind of the maximalist sense um in that like if you're, you know, you're, you own, let's say your assets are on one shard or whatever, mm-hmm. um, but if you end up having to interface with three, five, ten other shards, um, mm-hmm. right now as a user, it's actually not clear how you will actually verify uh, yourself that, you know, things executed correctly on the other shards. Um, in, in a theoretical world where statelessness, you know, works, um, you can get there, but like that is still a undefined, you know, unsolved problem space. Maybe to interject there just for a second. So I didn't mean like sort of the, the sharding that the sharding as in the Ethereum two roadmap, but just sort of the I see it like the roll up centric roadmap of Ethereum also as logical sharding because like if you don't use a roll up, then you don't have to verify it, but it still scales Ethereum as a whole. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So so slightly slightly different definition. Um, and again, I just want to make sure we're, we're very clear. Mm-hmm. Um, I would actually argue so sharding maintains logical centralization. Um, because the difference between sharding and, and roll-ups, right, is that in a shard, um, if you execute a tr- in like Near or Polkadot or Cosmos or whatever, theoretically in these systems, if you say, hey, go interact with this transaction on this other shard, you know, the, the inner shard protocol will figure it out and just do it for you. And mm-hmm. the issuing transaction does not need to know or care which, which other shards the pieces of state are on. Um, and, and the sharding protocol itself handles that magically. Um, the, the difference between rollups and sharding is that rollups, by definition, break that because the layer one system does not know that layer two even exists. Um, and, and so you cannot automatically route that through the logic of the, of the shard itself. Um, so so rollups break logical centralization. Sharding theoretically maintains it. Sorry, I know it's just very <laughs> nuanced kind of technical yeah. wizardry. Um, so, so I guess the original question was, yeah, like layered approach versus... Um, versus kind of horizontal scaled single approach. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think answering this question 
is a question of like, what trade-offs are you making and what are you prioritizing for? Um, I think the right thing you have to prioritize is sufficient decentralization and then optimal user. For some minimum level of decentralization, which primarily gives you censorship resistance, that's the property you're really getting, Mm -hmm. Um, have some minimum threshold of that. And then beyond that threshold, do not optimize for decentralization more and instead optimize for um, developer experience and user experience. Um, that is how I think about that. The, the problem is that if, as you decentralize to, to the maximum degree, as you go just further and further down the decentralization curve, you create engineering problems, um, you create developer experience problems, user experience problems. Um, and the, the theoretical solutions to these problems are things like sharding and rollups. Um, and, and I'm not convinced that you need to go that far down the decentralization spectrum to, to make these things sufficiently censorship resistant to achieve the, the kinds of, of properties you want out of these systems. Yeah. So, um, maybe a good question to ask is, so what is enough decentralization? I mean, lots of people probably have lots of different opinions on this. Is there like a first principles way to, way to approach this? Um, yeah, so I think probably the best thing I've seen written on this, right, is, is maybe that Blog Post Biology wrote back in, I want to say 2017, um, on quantifying decentralization. Um, and you can quantify it across lots of metrics. Um, probably the most obvious ones are stake distribution slash hash power distribution, um, number of clients, a number of major implementations, and obviously, you know, stake or hash distribution of those. Um, number of validators um, in the consensus group. Um, the number of validators or miners who can uh, impact liveness. Um, so that's one third in proof of stake or 51% in proof of work. Um, right. So that, that distribution, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, those are probably the metrics that matter. And then maybe just like general wealth concentration um, for, you know, general like egalitarian equality purposes. I don't think there's any others that, that seriously matter. Those are probably the, the five or six that matter. Of those, I think you can probably stack rank um, them to some degree. Mine, if you ask Anatoly from Solana, he'll tell you the, num the one that matters is um, number, of, number of consensus validators that can get you to one third of the stake because um, that is how you freeze, centered, like that's how you impact censorship resistance and how you can theoretically roll back the chain and, and create liveness problems and make the system fundamentally less usable for its intended purpose, which is DeFi. And that, that to me feels like a very clear and reasonably objective way to think about it. It may not be the correct way, but, but it is at least a, a cogent, cogent view of the problem. Yeah, I think to, to add into what you're saying there too, I, I totally agree. And, and I also think that decentralization is often, a, it's often a very emotional word for people because a lot of people, when they come into crypto, they think that it needs to be a certain amount of decentralization for it to have any value at all or have any meaning at all. And I mentioned in one of our, of, of our earliest Uncommon Core uh, podcast the idea of like a spectrum and, and, and sort of at that time I was talking about centralized exchanges and like comparing CME futures trading against FTX, against Deribit, against BitMEX and these kind of concepts and, and, then, and then saying that, you know, people, they, they think too much in terms of the absolutes, like th this will kill that or this will kill that. And I think the reality is like, it's all intersubjective. If the market demands a very high standard of decentralization for a specific task and it ends up doing so, then then that may make sense for that. But for a lot of uh, what people currently do on DeFi and, and a lot of what people might use blockchains for and, and block space for, um, there is definitely a concept of, of, of like of overkill. I think and and I think that um, I think that like like you guys have been very smart to, to this thesis of this idea that. Um, doing things on chain is fundamentally useful um and that uh if you go a little bit further on the spectrum uh you can get a lot more done basically yeah it's it's obviously a spectrum i, I think you know a year and a half ago that discourse was non-existent yeah. I, I think today it's it's reasonably existent um and I, I think a lot of people have real open questions about you know how much decentralization is enough and, and which vectors really matter mm -hmm. um Right, pro definitely one that matters is number of validators to get you to a third of the stake weight. Um, num number, and, and, and that needs to be, you know, if you look at like ETH2, because there's no native delegation, you have to kind of suss that out between 
the stated number of validators and then the number of validators who are controlled by Coinbase or controlled by Lido or controlled by Kraken or Binance or whatever. Um, and so um, just be, so th that, that's kind of an interesting sub point. The other one to think about is just, um, and, and, and that, that metric is specifically important as you think about liveness thresholds and, and how, what number of people can collude to impact liveness of the system. The other real fundamental property that matters is censorship resistance. Um, and, and there, basically, all you need is just more validators validating the system. Um, and as you go from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 validators, you're just getting more censorship resistance because basically, right, if anyone tries to block a transaction, um, right, or, or insert an invalid transaction, you just need more and more people watching them and more and more people in, in the consensus group um, such that the transactions will get included. Um, and, and be verified. Um, so those are probably the two most important ones. Um, if you look today at, at those, you know, well, let's talk about the second one first, censorship resistance. I think that's probably the, the more important one um, on kind of a grand human history perspective, right? Is just make sure you can't be censored. Um, how many nodes need to be in the consensus group, right? Such that collusion is sufficient, sufficiently difficult such that you can get your transactions included. And my intuition there is like probably the number is 10,000. I mean, look, this is like very subjective, right? But like if there's more than 10,000 nodes around the world and, and you know that they are physically distributed or you have reasonable reason to believe that, then, you know, like what's the probability that, that you know, half of them, two thirds of them, right, are, are colluding that you're not going to get your transaction included in the block. Um, it just seems very, very hard to, to foresee that kind of large scale collusion. Is it really realistic that any system like whether it's proof of work but even more so proof of stake that it will ever have 10,000 distinct participants in the validator set because of all the you know economies of scale that are involved with staking and mining um proof of work i i, I mean well if it depends on your argument individual people mining versus the hash pools if you look about individual mm -hmm. miners I, i'm fairly certain there's a lot more than 10,000 people who mine today um, right, but they don't make their own blocks, right? They, they correct. outsource this to the mining pools. This is yeah. unlikely to ever change. Agreed. That basically 0% probability that will change in proof-of-work systems. Um, in proof-of-stake systems today, um, you, you know, if you look at Polkadot, um, I think Polkadot is something like 800 validators or thereabouts on the mainnet. I think Kusama is like 1,200 or something, somewhere in that range. Solana is around 600 validators on mainnet and around 1,200 on testnet. Cosmos and Tezos, I think, are in Algorand are all in the in the 1,000-ish range right now. Maybe 1,500, but none, none of them are 8,000 to my knowledge. But validators in those systems don't say anything about who owns the stake, right? The validator just represents one fixed amount of stake, and they are all the same size. Um, or is this different so in Solana? Uh, so I'm not I'm not sure. On the other, I know in Solana there's 600 nodes in consent participating in consensus today. Um, so they, they have stake and they've staked it and they're participating right. in consensus. But they could be and are probably controlled by a smaller number of people. Yeah, there's possible there's individuals running multiple nodes. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. What's nice in basically all the systems other than ETH2 ETH, ETH is there is no native delegation. Excuse me, ETH2 does not have native delegation, but the other ones do. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, and so the, the motivation for like having many nodes to represent a single piece of stake um, is reduced um, substantially when you have native delegation. Yeah. Um, so you're kind of in that range today. Is is your call it? You're in the thousand range plus or minus for most of these proof of stake systems. Um, and like getting to ten thousand doesn't seem very hard to me. Like a ten x is just like pretty reasonable um, on a three to five year time horizon. Um, I, I'd say the probability is, in my mind, is like 90 percent that these things are at more than ten thousand. Um, individual uh, consensus validators in three yeah. to five years' time. And how does it work that, um, like, they don't all, they may be in the consensus set, right? But do they really participate in, let's say, the making of the next 100 blocks? Because I, I remember, like, in BFT, for example, you have, in the BFT-based proof of stake, you have sort of this, 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 this hard upper cap of, like, 100 validators. Um, who can participate because of the, the because the communication overhead between them is so large? Um, so, uh, well, a few things to unpack here. Um, so, so one is assuming you have ten thousand consensus validators, 
um, assuming they were perfect distribution of stake, then obviously you're only participating on average one out of every 10,000 blocks. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So if your threshold is out of 100 blocks, then that doesn't really work. Um, uh, um, second comment on, on your, your BFT comment, um, it's not quite c- correct. Um, in, in, all these, in all these BFT systems, you have to trade off liveness for safety. Uh, well, either you, you have to choose prioritizing for liveness or prioritizing for safety, right? If, if the network splits, then do you stall or do you keep making blocks and then eventually remerge somehow? Um, is the, the fundamental question at hand. Um, Tendermint, which you know, I'd say is probably considered kind of the gold standard of proof of stake systems, mm-hmm. prioritizes safety over liveness. So it does, in fact, halt. Yes. Um, and what that, what that means is every single block on a block by block basis, every single node has to communicate with every other node so that they can finalize that block before moving on to the next block, um, which is the messaging overhead you just alluded to. Um, in systems like Solana, the Solana, and as well as ETH2, um, they prefer liveness to safety. And so that messaging overhead does not have to happen um, b- block by block. Like yep. you can make m- more blocks into the future even if a block isn't finalized. And so um, Solana um, does this, and I think most of the other liveness focused proof of stake systems do as well, where basically that communication overhead can afford to fall behind. Um, and the impact of that just means there's the time to latency may increase, right? And maybe one second, it may go to three seconds or five seconds, who knows, um, depending on network conditions. Um, but it doesn't prevent the rate of block production. And therefore, it also means that you can increase the validator set and keep block production going at the same pace. Um, what that will increase is latency to final to, to finalization. Will increase I see. Increase the yeah, I wasn't sure if Solana favors safety or liveness. So that answers it for me. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, you were talking about decentralization of the validator set. Right, right, right. right. So, so most of the non-ETH2 proof-of-stake systems today have a thousand-ish validators, plus or minus a few hundred. Um, so the question is, like, can that grow? And there's no theoretical reason why they can't. Um, there's just kind of questions of, like, do more people want to run nodes, basically, right? Um, and my intuition is just as these systems grow, if you look at Bitcoin, look at Ethereum, those are the two oldest ones. Mm-hmm. In basically every dimension, they have continued to decentralize um, over time. Um, and that's been a relatively monotonic process um, in terms of political control of kind of the governance of these systems, in terms of the number of applications built on them, the number of nodes, um, even just like who makes the ASICs. Right. I mean, just kind of in every way, these things have, have all decentralized over time because basically as the aggregate dollar value of the system grows, um, there's just more and more incentive for random people to get involved in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, and so the, a growing market cap, I would argue, um, generally increases decentralization. And I, I think that trend will continue. Um, I don't really see why that won't continue. Um, even, even things like a stake distribution, right? Like there's a lot of people who invested early in Ethereum who owned a huge percentage of Ethereum. Uh, like Joe Lubin obviously owned a massive percentage of Ethereum. Um, I don't know if he still does, but, but he certainly did at one point in time. Because right, consensus was burning like $100 million a month. <laughs> um, and, and so he just had to own a huge amount of Ether to, to, to underwrite that. Um, even like, look at like, right, like criticism of, of Solana, like, oh, well, Multicoin and Alameda own too much. Like, okay. But like, we are forced sellers at some point. Like our, literally our fund has a life. Like, we have to return the money. Um, and so um, I, I kind of don't, like, like, even things like stake distribution have to get decentralized over time. Um, and, and so as long as market cap is growing, um, I, I think basically all metrics of decentralization kind of have to move in the right direction. Yeah, I generally agree with your comment that decentralization increases over time and that it's a function of how many people care about the protocol. And... This is sort of the, the biggest driver ahead of any like technical properties. Um, and those are actually also the two that I would say, like you touched on them in the in the like in your longer explanation, but you didn't mention them explicitly. I'd say that the political governance of these systems is definitely very important. So who decides the roadmap? Like how difficult is it to change the consensus rules? And um and then the second um, sort of, and this is this is I think also at the heart of the debate between these two approaches is the culture of validation among users, because 
it's true that um, sort of you need a certain thresh need to pass a certain threshold of malicious block block producers and the block producer said in order to corrupt liveness and safety in these systems um, but even if sort of this threshold is reached then if if the if many users sort of validate the state transition of these networks then what what like sort of the evil that these block producers can do is is, is much more strictly limited so my question to you would be sort of is this something that you're willing to sacrifice or how how much do we have to have to sacrifice this property of sort of non-block producers also validating the chain keeping the block producers in check yeah so again this varies a little in proof of work versus proof of stake to some degree um in in proof of you i mean in um bitcoin right like the not in, in bitcoin is particularly weird because right, you have like four mining pools or whatever that control more than half the hash power and if i recall there was an episode i want to say it was in in 2015 or 2016 right where the miners actually stopped they started producing invalid blocks um, as like some sort of shortcut to like increase their hashing or something um, and, and the full nodes ended up catching them and, and <laughs> um, right so you, you that that fundamental need for more validating nodes is fundamentally important mm -hmm. um, what's interesting in, in proof of work versus proof of stake is that dynamic exists to a lot lesser degree uh, because you don't have this massive capex spend where your your goal is to, uh, is just to juice your your hardware as much as possible at the expense of other people um, in proof of stake you just have you know Probably like probabilistic rotations based on stake weight, um, and so that those kind of fixed some dynamics of I increase my hash power with some game at the expense of everyone else um, is it exists to some degree in proof of stake, but to a, a substantially less degree. Um, and so that, that that dynamic is kind of redu reduced. Um, the other comment is just you know doesn't matter even if you assume there's no one valid verifying consensus validators other than consensus validators. Um, and it's not clear to me the answer to that is yes. Um, if you've got 20,000 nodes in consensus or 50,000 nodes, in, or even let's just say 10,000 on the low end, um, are enough of, can you assume enough of them are honest that it keeps the system in check? Because the good thing is if anyone produces an invalid block, like that's easily slashable. Um, and censorship is just a function of, of node count. Um, and then liveness is just a function of stake weight up to one third. Um, and so if your focus is, is as a user, do I know my transaction will be included, then you just need more nodes in the system to maximize the probability. If your concern is someone is screwing with the system, again, you just need more nodes. Um, whether they're consensus or not actually is, is not super relevant. Um, as long as there is slashing built in, and as long as some nodes can identify that and submit the you know, invalid, right, proof to the rest of the nodes. Um, and then the third is just, you know, will in fact there be some sort of, of uh, what's it called, uh, liveness attack, right, where like you get a, a large amount of history gets rewritten. Um, and, and that's actually the hardest to solve. That, that's actually the, the highest bar um, of all of these to solve. Um, because you, it's hard to force stake distribution, especially among the top validators. Okay, so it seems that we started from this you know, point, like on the one hand, we said all these systems started as completely centralized and they decentralized over time. But now at the same time, we are arguing there's this counter force uh, on sort of the meta level, not inside the individual projects, but sort of between them, where more you know, projects come online that sort of erode uh, these ideals of decentralization that have sort of emerged in the community in order to you know get something out of it right get more get better user experience get better developer experience uh, be, be a better platform for DeFi. so sort of where does it stop right is this like is there like in two years from now sort of the you know the more user friendly the more scalable solana um that sort of instead of having like supporting a thousand validators will just say okay like we decided that 12 validators you know, geographically distributed, sort of like Libra, that this is enough? Or like, w at what point do the, do the users feel sort of that uh, until here and no further, right, in terms of eroding decentralization? Um, yeah, so a few kind of comments around this. Um, the first is, 
should a protocol prescribe a level of decentralization? Um, um, ETH2 does prescribe a level of decentralization. There are 64 shards. They prescribe, right, like how many, um, what's it called, like the hardware requirements per shard. Like, like it is, it, there's ideological um, dogma built into the protocol. Um, it has represented in shard count as well as hardware requirements per shard. Um, BSC, the same thing, obviously. Every kind blockchain along does the, that. Uh, opposite I mean, direction, but the same thing, right? Yeah. Um, interestingly, Solana actually does not prescribe anything at the protocol layer at all. Um, Solana does not prescribe hardware requirements. Solana does not prescribe node counts um, of anything. Um, Solana protocol lets all of that fall to the market itself. Um, now, Solana, the protocol does happen to be optimized for GPUs, which do happen to run on you know, 4,000 concurrent cores. Um, and I, I'd say it, it assumes, I'd say the one thing Solana assumes is that there, you have a reasonably high bandwidth computer, um, just so that the, the proof of history um, and all the, the messages related to that um, can, can go in and out. Um, but beyond that, it really assumes nothing about the node count or the hardware accounts. Um, and all of those decisions about what is the degree of hardware you need to keep up with the parallel transaction execution and what is the degree of hardware you need to keep up with the proof of history um, with, with running the, the hashing cycles. Those, those are the two most important questions to actually answering how decentralized is it. Um, and those are not prescribed in the protocol whatsoever. Um, those are exclusively decided by the users, by the market, um, where that's some combination of non-staking users and then people who stake the validators and then the validators themselves, right? And there, there's some, and then I guess, you know, there's obviously they have the soft social power of like, what does the Solana core team say about what they recommend? Um, what does Sam or what does Kyle have to say about, you know, those things as well? So there, there's all that kind of soft social discourse. Um, but the protocol itself says nothing. Um, now that's a kind of a technocratic answer, but I think it's worth n noting. Um, the, the better realistic answer is, um, you know, in practice, like the Solana Foundation, they, they, have, they have recommended computer specs on the website. Um, and most of the validators today do, in fact, adhere to those specs. And so if you try and join with a lesser computer, like, you won't keep up. Um, so there's obviously some practical reality here. Um, but it's worth noting that, that all of these dynamics around does it decentralize or does it centralize over time are not in any way dictated by the protocol. Um, it, it's only dictated by, by the market. Um, yeah, I mean, th but there are reasons, right, why all other um, protocols sort of have these, they, they cap sort of stuff like throughput, state growth, bandwidth requirements. Um, and that is for one, to sort of protect the, the non-mining users, the non-staking users, because they, like their private benefit from validating the state transition is quite low, right? It's just... I want to make sure that I'm on the right chain. Um, and that's basically it, right? And um, But for them, you know, the incentive to do this is quite low as long as, as enough other people do it. And that's why you sort of have this verifier's dilemma on, on all layer one and layer two blockchains. Um, but the second one is also to, and this is, I think this is a bigger deal in, in, in proof of work than proof of stake, but I might be wrong, which is sort of also protect sort of the weakest of uh, the miners and stakers um, because it, like in proof of work we have seen this like if um, there's this theoretical attack vector where you know larger miners their blocks have longer propagation times and so they want to mine blocks that are as large as possible and so if you if you leave the block size to the free market then you know sort of the the steady state is that blocks will just keep growing um, validation, like the, the propagation times will keep growing and this puts, this is basically selfish mining, selfish mining attack vector, like an automatic one. Um, do you see any, any of those risks in Solana? Um, so I'm not worried about the selfish mining kind of a thing. Proof of stake kind of naturally solves that with, with kind of guaranteed timing of, of moving between, um, nodes. So, so that, that's but, not. But, but notes, I mean, the validators can miss their. There's a like they have slots, right? So in, in all liveness favoring proof of stake systems, there are like these slots where that your node has like let's say I don't know one second or half a second in Solana time to produce a block, 
And if they miss their slot, then they don't get the reward and get like sort of a micro slashing or something. Um, yeah, so they don't penalize you for they don't penalize you for liveness failures. Mm-hmm. Um, at least not not like on an individual basis like that. Um, and the same is true in ETH as, as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, conceptually, if you're not online and ready to go, then you're going to miss your. You don't have the hard requirements as a validator. You are going to miss your. your and can blocks get so large that uh, sort of the smaller nodes fail to produce a block in time, or is this this is like totally outlandish? That the- <clears throat> no, no, no. It's absolutely a real thing. In fact, if you go to Solana Beach, um, which is the kind of the main Solana Block Explorer slash network overview thing, um, if you go to the list of the validators, I think there's a validators tab. Um, and you click on the validators, one of the key metrics you'll see is basically like, uh, I think it's called slot um, uptime or something. I, I forget mm-hmm. what it's called. Basically, it means what percentage of the time are those validators hitting, like responding in time to the rest of the network with transactions from their slots. Um, I, I, from what I recall, the median today is something like 85%. Wow. Um, and, and that number has been growing. But that's, uh, that's quite low. Like, why do you think it is that low? Yeah, I mean, it's because the blocks, so the blocks slot times are about four or 500 milliseconds, and then you rotate blocks every four blocks, or excuse me, rotate validators every four slots. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's say you're rotating on average every two seconds. Um, so just, yeah, communication overhead around the world, like, inevitably some people are, are just missing, um, are missing that. Um, but that, that's just, like, that's just okay. Like, it, 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 it doesn't, ma- like, it act, well, it reduces throughput because obviously you just have empty slots. So it does impact performance. But beyond that, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's a strong centralizing force in the validator set. Because those who miss their, their slots, they will just lose money over time being a validator and then stop validating. Um, yeah, I mean, can you, do they all collude all right, and, and that kind of a thing? Um, I, I'm generally pretty skeptical of like large-scale collusion among lots of independent parties. Oh, I didn't mean collusion or anything like that. Just that larger block producers have a strong incentive to mine larger blocks. But I mean, no, I, actually, I might, I might also just be wrong, and this doesn't apply at all to sort of this, that, that you can affect this as a validator because the slot is the slot, right? Um, it's like you don't need to wait for someone else's block to build on it. Unlike. In, Correct. I think unlike in proof of work. Correct. So, right, like in Solana specifically, the point of the end of the whole proof of history system is that everyone is maintaining an independent clock, um, which is the repeated the hash. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so if someone misses their slot, if you're the next guy, you just don't care that the last guy missed their slot, and you can make sure you're ready to go. Yeah. Okay. But nonetheless, I mean, that 15% of validators miss their slot on a like consistent basis, That I think that shows that, you know, the there is a centralizing force there in the block producer set. Um, yes, yes, potentially. Uh, I, I mean, directionally, that's obviously true. Um, but I, I also think that the, the countervailing forces, um, just system optimization, is just like a long ways to go. There's a lot of known things that the Solana team wants to do um, to improve um, redundancy in the system and, and make that better. Um, I would suspect that general call it um, consistency of performance will probably you know, over the next 12 to 24 months, you'll, you'll see a two or three X kind of growth in um, or a two or three X reduction in, in kind of missed failures. Because um, hmm. it's just like all, of, all new systems like this, just it takes a long time to optimize them. Um, yep. And the Solana team is very open about that. In fact, they actually still call the system beta for this reason because they, they know there are so many optimizations they haven't done yet but they're unwilling to take the beta tag off of it. I think backing up too, and, and just talking about your point about um, supply decentralization or, or distributing over time, I think people underestimate how quickly supply can distribute if the protocol is actually being used and it's useful for people, right? Like, um, if you think about Ethereum in 2016, supply was incredibly decentralized. It just took one year and ICOs and, and a lot of activity and, you know, everyone in the world that knows what Ethereum is at that point. And then now to today, very few people relatively talk about Ethereum supply being, you know, controlled by only a few people. And, and, and so I do think that utility solves all actually uh, when it comes to supply decentralization, because if people want to get their hands on it and it's useful for them, then it's, then it'll just happen. Even if it starts less decentralized, I think also 
if you look at the way that Solana and and also Polkadot and, and Kusama, the way that they did their sort of listings and then their price history and just being able to ha- like allowing normal individuals to access those assets from relatively early on, I think there's clearly a a very a relatively broad holder set than what uh, what I think people. Um, would have assumed when these projects were in their seed phase, right? Like I remember thir- during the seed phase of a lot of these, I remember Kyle Kyle came to us and and asked us to join them in the in one of the rounds, and and we ended up passing because we didn't look closely enough. And then later on, we realized like we made a mistake and we bought a lot of it OTC, and we also went and and just like did a lot more research in, into the thesis. But back then, the main criticism of Solana was that you know, the, you know, only a few people would own a lot of it and, and this kind of stuff. And, and I truly think that this is one of the biggest red herrings in, in investing because at the end of the day, it's, it's about, it's about technology and community. So if they have a way to, uh, create a community, if they have, a, if they have legitimate technology, then, then like distribution is not a problem. Right. And, and, and so I think, um, I think people forget that all of these things started relatively centralized, right? Like Bitcoin, when Satoshi mined the first block, he had all, he, like he had it all. So like, like everything starts from that. And then, you know, from that point of view, these newer POS chains, uh, they, they ultimately are a little bit more well engineered, like in a sense, because they think very critically about how do they want to give out supply? How do they want to bring people in? How do they want to create organic, uh, you know, reward early adopters, reward people coming in? Like with Mina, you know, with the, you know, with the CoinList uh, sale, I think, you know, tens of thousands of people are able to to buy it on CoinList. Like, I think there's, there's a sort of like, an, an advantage of modernity, like in a way, with some of the newer chains that, that have launched, because they've been able to see the history of a lot of other chains, and they can go and say, "How how do we, despite starting relatively centralized, because we need to have actual cash to be able to 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 fund the tech technology, to then later go and how how do we decentralize supply over time, um, while making sure that there's still um, a lot of activity going on." So, I just think like that's like a complete red herring in investing in crypto. I think. The other point I would I would make a couple points I make building on that one is if you look at the pace of decentralization um, of Bitcoin versus Ethereum, obviously Ethereum decentralized a lot faster, um, and it's because like no one was paying attention to Bitcoin in two thousand nine, right? No one knew what any of these things were. Um, there was a lot of education that had to happen and such. Um, if you look at then look at like where Solana is today versus where Ethereum was, Solana is about one year old. It's about mm, thirteen or fourteen months old. Um, if you look at, at Ethereum 13 months after, it launched in July 15, so 13, 14 months later, it was like they went through the DAO hard fork and you know, like there was nothing on the chain other than the DAO and then the hard fork of the DAO, um, right? And so it's obvious that like the pace at which the ecosystem is growing is just a lot faster now than what it was then. Um, that's not, I don't mean to like criticize Ethereum, it's just there was no one paying attention to crypto back then and a whole bunch of, of things have changed. Um, but, but but the nature of comparing time, uh, it, time is compressing, um, right? Where like the pace at which these things can decentralize is a lot faster now than it was then. Um, if, you look at Ethereum, if you look at the Solana network today, this is crazy to, to think about. So um, uh, the Commissioner Hinman from the SEC gave a speech in June of 2018 saying Ethereum is not a security, or ETH is not a security. If you look at the state of the Ethereum network at that time, um, Uniswap did not exist. Um, I think Compound had not yet launched. I think the, they had raised money, but they hadn't launched a product. Um, Maker did exist. Um, Zero X did exist. I think Kyber had maybe just launched like V1 or like was about to launch V1. Um, and like either Delta was around. And that was about it. Um, there was like a few hundred million dollars in stable coins, not that much even in stable coins on, on the system. Um, and, and so... You look at Solana today, there's like a billion stable coins, there's 1.6 billion in TVL, Serum is doing nine figures in trading volume a day. Like it, it's it, it's kind of crazy to, to think about the non-linearity of, of how fast these things grow. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a, a backwards facing comment on thinking about this kind of red herring that, that Sue alluded to. Um, and then I think if you project that forwards, the non-linearity gets even more interesting. Um, the way I, I, what I, I think is going to happen, right, is like, you have all these 
permissionless DeFi crypto thingies, um, right? And obviously, a lot of people around the world are paying attention to this stuff right now. And they're all trying to figure out what does it mean for my business. Um, and this is true for both kind of finance companies as well as banks. But like, you have to imagine every tech company and every social media company in the world right now is thinking about this stuff, saying, like, what's here? And they're all looking at BitCloud. They're looking at social tokens. You know, like, there's obviously just a lot of cool ideas here. Uh, uh, like, it's a very interesting design space. Um, none of them have done anything yet on a public chain. Um, Facebook tried to go their own way with, with Libra slash DM and it doesn't appear that that's working for, I'm not sure why, but, but for whatever reason they have problems. Um, but my point is that no one actually has done anything on a public chain. Um, most interestingly, the one company that got close was Reddit and they like, got really excited about like, doing a point system thingy. Um, they like, did this big public bake-off right, last summer and their conclusion was none of these things are ready. Um, we're going to do something permissioned and private ourselves. Um, and, and so it just kind of tells you like how not ready the, like, like that, that's the biggest, most em empirical demonstration of how not ready these systems are for scaling to large numbers of users. Um, and that, that was nine months ago that happened. It was about nine months ago. Um, when I think about what can happen over the next nine to 24 months, um, I know all these companies are looking at doing crypto things. Um, and the number one thing they're all worried about is scale, right? Is they don't want to break, they don't have bad user experience. They want to make sure it's going to work. They want to make sure the fees are low and, and all that stuff. Um, and I'd actually argue that like, it, if a real company with, you know, let's say 50 million plus daily users says, hey, we're going to move our users onto a blockchain and for some core operation that's like, you know, native to the application, right? That like you expect 50 million people to use multiple times per day. Um, the first time that happens, um, that blockchain um, is now the most likely to become the largest blockchain in the world. Um, because once that happens, then most other people, other companies in the world are going to say, okay, let's watch and see what happens to these guys. Um, because there's a lot of technical risk involved, a lot of product risk. I mean, there's just like a lot of operational execution risk, right? In so many ways to pull this off. Um, and... Um, so everyone's going to kind of sit back and say, okay, let's see if these guys fall on their face or not. And assuming it works, then the amount of, of uh, convergence of perspective you're going to get among kind of global engineering leadership around the world is saying, okay, like this is the least risky way to scale these things to 50, 100 million, 200 million users. Um, like right, that, that, can, that perception is going to change very fast. Um, and, and so I, I don't generally hold this, this dogma that like, it, well, well, my back to Sue's point of like um, perceptions can change. Um, I, I think the, the pace at which these things can change um, is extraordinarily small um, and the momentum can shift. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, I think the, I, I don't think any of these core debates are over because you're going to see these types of announcements are going to come. I don't th think they're imminent in the next six months. I, I think that's probably a little premature, but I'm optimistic within 18 months, you're going to see at least one major tech company do something that's like fundamental to the business that incorporates the public chain. I'm, I don't have a good track record of predicting these things, but I, I'm st I, st I would still say that I would be very surprised if that's true. I mean, I, maybe I like just the creativity to see what a pub using a public blockchain can do to you know, the products that these businesses offer and why they wouldn't rather use an experience that they control, either just using a regular database or like, do you have any example in your mind of like, even when Reddit made the announcement, I thought that it was stupid and it didn't make any sense. So the, the right frame to think here, I think, is not one of control. Um, it's actually the opposite. It's one of liability. Uh, Vitalik wrote a really good blog post about this. I don't know, mm -hmm. six, nine, twelve months ago. I, I forget. Um, it was it was phenomenal, where he basically said the the conversations increasingly inside of companies because of GDPR, because of all these hacks, is mm -hmm. data. I mean, look, if you're Google and Facebook, you have like a big machine learning business. Like, okay, you, you have some data requirements, but for most other businesses that are not doing large scale ML stuff, um, is data an asset or is data a liability? Um, and 
you, you know, you keep seeing these hacks, you keep, right? You just keep seeing all this stuff happen. Cambridge Analytica, I mean, it's just target. I mean, just constantly all these things keep happening. Um, and I, I think, you know, with a little bit more regulatory push um, from various jurisdictions, um, it's not hard to see a world in which um, a lot of companies start to view data as a liability instead of data as an asset. And how do blockchains set with that? Yeah, so I mean, what blockchains provide is the substrate such that you can design applications where users own the data, they own the state, whether that state represents money in the form of a social token or something else, or whether that represents, you know, your telegram messages or, or whatever. Now, is telegram going to move over to some decentralized system soon? No, because the scale of messaging is, is, is too long. Like, that's the highest order engineering problem because it's just like trillions of messages per day are sent. Um, but there's a lot of intermediate things between here and there that are just much lower volume. Um, that, you know, if it's like 100 million messages per day, um, you know, can you, can you get that over in, in decentralized capacity? Um, and um, it, it, I think Vitalik's probably right that on the longer your horizon, the more that data is a liability, not an asset. Uh, I, I think that's right. Um, and, and so what do companies do? Um, I think the obvious design spaces are uh, financial inclusion types of things where the companies can say, look, we don't, we're not a money transmitter. You know, they can kind of um, say we're not liable. Mm -hmm. um, and then anything related to kind of social tokens and creator economy stuff, all that feels very ripe for this kind of a thing. Um, I do think probably the social media and social adjacent companies are probably the, the most interesting for this design space. Um, I think relatively, you look at like, you know, Reddit. I mean, look, I'm not like a Reddit user. I've always kind of thought Reddit was stupid. I, I just, it, it's messy and hard to, to filter through. Um, but like, there's some interesting design space here of, of karma points or credibility points or whatever you want to call them on a per Reddit, you know, per forum basis. Um, and people want to put embed value into that. Um, for Reddit to Im imbue value into that as Reddit makes them a money transmitter and a lot of the things they don't want to deal with. And so this is just a clever reg regulatory arbitrage for Reddit to imbue value in their systems without becoming a money transmitter. Um, so I think all of these vectors are, are very interesting for, for big companies to, to start to, to, to engage mm -hmm. with this stuff. Um, the other comment I would say just generally is um, with most new technologies that are orthogonal to a lot of existing things, um, they tend to seep into the world in, in ways that are very not predictable. Um, the internet being kind of the best example of this. Um, th there's a good uh, Mark Andreessen quote about this. Um, he says, I now assume every entrepreneur that comes into the investment committee to pitch us, I assume that they are right. Like whatever their core thesis is, is correct. Um, the only question is timing. Um, now that's like a somewhat of a kind of extremist view. He's obviously being a little bit hyperbolic, but like um, directionally, there's like a nugget of truth in there. Um, and, and I've kind of, you know, doing this for a few years now has made me a lot more open to that general line of reasoning. I just kind of assume all these weird things people pitch me, even if I think they're dumb. Um, you just have to kind of assume they're right. The question is just a, a function of timing. I think a, I think an interesting thing that happened yesterday to that point as well is GameStop announcing that they're going to do this nifty thing on Ethereum, right? And I remember when, when GameStop first came to the mainstream, there was then a lot of talk, well, GameStop should put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And then that would be a great way to like play crypto. And, and then, you know, they've gone and done their research and they've decided actually what we want to do is put NIFTs on, you know, on Ethereum. And, and I think that there's a few, there's a few, I think, conclusions we can draw from that. I think one is that for, for businesses that are, um, you know, Gen Z native, internet native, millennial native, uh, there is a huge growing interest in the idea of social uh, collectible uh, internet of value thesis. This stuff, when you explain it to these types of owners of these businesses, it truly excites them. And I think the idea that they want to control a centralized database of this stuff, like, if you're running with that company, you can't tell them with a straight face you want to control that database yourself, right? Because what what advantage do you get? Like if GameStop went and said, you know what, I'm going to make a database of collectibles. You, you can now collect these things in my database. Like 
if you said that in the boardroom of GameStop, you'd be laughed at, right? Like it just sounds insane. So I think that there's we're getting to the point now where in those discussions, if the person advocating a centralized database will soon seem like uh, the most crazy guy in the room, uh, and the guy, and then the question will only be, you know, which chain do we deploy to? Um, do we use a newer chain? How how much uh, you know? What features do we want? What what user experience do we want? And and so I think that 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 whole concept of the centralized database, I think, um, it assumes several things about what companies want that that isn't really true, right? It assumes that they that they um, that they aren't able to do the research and then figure out um, what's what could make their business work. They've now already seen the growth of DeFi. They've seen Top Shots. They've seen Nifties. And 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 they once that imagination is kind of sparked and the sort of reflexivity of this entire um uh like adoption phase, I think that I think that there's you're we're we're completely entering the stage now where assuming that crypto is sort of able to serve as this credible neutrality settlement layer that internet native companies find this incredibly interesting and want to deploy as soon as possible their biggest ideas. Yeah, I, I agree. The, it, it's hard to remember now, but like a lot of companies ran a lot of experiments with the internet back in, right back in the day. Um, and it took a lot of people a long time to figure out what to do. Um, like, um, but a lot of the core ideas were there from day one. Things like forums, things like chat, um, and even things like like CRMs and databases and those, those things. And, they, and like all those core ideas have been present from you know early '90s. Um, and you know, I look today and kind of the obvious ones are DeFi and digital collectibles um, are like the two really big obvious ones. And um, I think there will be more that kind of iterate from there, but. Uh, the number of places you can insert those those core primitives, um, I think, is is measured in billions of daily active users. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic this stuff will happen, and the companies that already have distribution will, in fact, be the primary distribution for the stuff. Um, I don't think this is going to be like the internet, where basically you had a whole bunch of new companies come in and disrupt the old guys, and the old guys didn't figure it out. Um, I'm a lot more optimistic that internet native companies um, will see the pattern, see the trends going on. Um, and not all of them will adopt, will adapt correctly. For sure, a, lot, a, lot of the, a number of them will fail. But um, I think the leading social media companies, specific, anyone, any company that has deep social roots in it, um, I think it's very probable that they figure out how to embed these new primitives um, into their product and service um, in a compelling way. But they're not asleep at the wheel. Um, in fact, most of them are founder-led, um, and, and those companies are, are likely to rejigger their products. Yeah, I mean, personally, I think that the the vision of decentralized social media is very compelling, in the sense that sort of the state is is public and uncensorable, and users can choose between different interfaces that may have different amounts of different levels of moderation, and those can then be regulated. Um, I agree that it's definitely a question of timing. Like in the Web three vision, this this part seems the most compelling to me. Um, but I don't know how many years out it is. And then about what you said earlier, I think that this is this is maybe or one of the most interesting aspects of DeFi, sort of removing liability from financial service providers. Um, so there are two reasons why <laughs> regulation exists, right? One is sort of keep like for the incumbents to keep sort of competitors out, but also it really to protect like um, consumers and um, you know, just protect the, the, the economy itself from uh, yeah, so, sort of moral hazard and so on and, and contagious sort of effects. And, um, and I feel like this part you can really, at least the second part, you can really get around by, you know, using smart contracts. Like, you know, just in general, this concept of a company tying their own hands. I mean, if you can do that, then all of a sudden a lot of need for cumbersome regulation disappears. Uh, well, it can't be evil, right? Not don't be evil. Mm. So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, 
So, okay, so we talked about sort of what it takes for developers to adopt this and definitely the user experience and the you know, transaction costs and some minimum level of decentralization are definitely big parts of that. Um, but another that we have seen that is very, like a very potent network effect is sort of the, um, the execution environment and programming language um, for developers and all the tooling around that. And I would say that the EVM and Solidity are huge leaders right now in that area. And um, Solana uses, uh, I think, a Rust, like uses a Rust-based uh, execution environment. Can, can you like talk a bit about that and how you think that the basically the advantage of the EVM is not already insurmountable? Um, yeah, so Solana has a, a custom runtime called C level. Um, it is uh, a uh, LL, it, it compiles to LLVM um, and then compiles to kind of a, a new instruction set called uh, Berkeley, e Berkeley DAC filter or BPF. That, that stuff is well below my understanding of kind of core, like how circuits switch and how memory is stored and how processors transact things. So there, there's a level of technical depth there that I'm not qualified to speak about. Um, what I do know is that Solana compiles down to kind of a native code. And the, the Rust actually gets the LLVM compiles down to native, native code. Um, so you're kind of getting native execution um, as opposed to some intermediate layer. The EVM actually acts as a virtual machine, um, mm -hmm. which is in the name. Solana, you'll note, it's not the C-level is not called a VM. It's, it's called a runtime. So... Um, you have kind of this abstraction with the virtual machine. Um, and again, the kind of the depth, technical depth of virtual machines is, is beyond me and probably beyond the scope of this podcast. Yeah. But um, uh, suffice to say, it's just generally understood that they create they're kind of a, a, a bottleneck um, kind of in terms of, of processing efficacy. Um, so one of the core insights the Solana team had was to say, look, we need to be able to get... One of the really interesting things to think about in these networks is... Um, you have a fixed amount of computational space, right? And, th and that space is, well, there's the physical bandwidth, but there's also just the physical processors and graphics cards. Um, and you have literally billions of people trying to theoretically share this fixed amount of, of resource space. Given that, you need to optimize every ounce of performance out of the system to make sure that you can run at the limits of what the hardware can actually do. And so one of the, the core things that Solana team recognized early on was the EVM was you just not... Um, in any way kind of optimized to take advantage of hardware, um, both in terms of just efficacy on a, a kind of a per instruction basis, but even more importantly, um, in terms of parallelism. Um, and this is probably the most important difference between the EVM and C-level, um, which is that um, Solana natively supports parallel transaction execution. Um, if you think about DeFi or even just payment flows, right? if I pay Sue and then you, Ha Su, pay someone else, there's no dependencies between those two things. Um, and so those, those things should transact in parallel. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the problem in kind of a blockchain is that right, you have this completely open state and anyone can submit any transaction into the state at any time. And any transaction can theoretically modify any part of the state. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know in advance what it's, gonna, what it's gonna to, to modify. And so if you enable concurrent transaction execution, um, the thing you have to make sure is you have to make sure that basically you don't have two transactions um, re reading and writing from the same piece of memory at the same time. Um, yeah, like two trades, two trades in the same Uniswap pool or whatever. Ex exactly, whatever. Plenty of examples you can come up with. Um, on, on a technical basis, you're specifically focused on on, on address space, um, right? like in, the, in memory itself. Um, that, that's really the core technical constraint. Um, so the EVM solves this problem by just saying, don't solve the problem and just force everything to run serially. Um, and if you do that, then like it's a solution, but obviously you forfeit parallelism. Um, interestingly, of all the other major chains, the only chain that even attempts to solve this problem um, within the context of a single shard is Solana. Um, the way they solve it is they basically say every transaction has a transaction header, um, and the transaction header specifies all the parts of the, of the state that that transaction can modify. Not that it will modify, because there may be some branching if logic in the transaction, um, but that it could modify based on all potential permutations um, of, you know, if statements in, in the transaction. So you have to, basically you just lock all of those pieces of state and say, I have, I am, get monopolistic um, rights over these parts of state for the course of this block. Um, 
And so by doing that, basically the system can then parallelize, it knows what every transaction is going to touch. Mm -hmm. And so you can parallelize all transactions that don't touch um, overlapping state. Um, and the benefit of doing this is that you can parallelize things. Um, modern graphics cards have about 4,000 cores. Um, and so you get kind of 4,000 lanes of parallelism, basically. Um, in a year or so, NVIDIA is going to release cards with 8,000 cores, and you just double the, the throughput. Um, when, when I think about the nature of these blockchain systems, you know, if you assume there's going to be social media applications from Snapchat and from, you know, BitCloud, and you're going to think there's going to be DeFi stuff, and you think there's people going to be trading tokenized securities. I mean, these are all like largely different things. Um, and by definition, like these different categories of applications are non-overlapping um, in what they do. And, and so it's only natural that you should be able to parallelize these transactions. Um, and it seems relatively clear to me that, you know, if you assume you got 100 million or a billion users doing all kinds of whatever, social media things, DeFi things, whatever, um, on a block by block basis where a block here, let's just say for simplicity is one second, um, the percentage of, of those transactions that will be actually demanding overlapping state right, on a per second time scale, uh, my intuition is that it's probably under 1%. Um, it may be under 0.1% of transactions are actually fighting over the same piece of state. Um, maybe it's 2 or 3%, like, but I'm pretty sure it's like not over 10% um, percent I mean, of, of transactions. In, in Ethereum, it's probably a lot more. Is this, well, is this, but I'm saying as you as you increase the array of applications. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Right. That that percentage has to drop. Ah, yeah. Okay. And and so um, my intuition is it's probably on the order of one percent. Maybe it's two or three. I, hard for me to believe it's higher than that. Um, and so if you don't parallelize, you're just forfeiting, you, you know, massive amounts of of throughput per unit of time. Um. And I think that's like super important for these things. And I think that's one of, one of the fundamental differences in, in Solana versus Ethereum. The downside, of course, is that you, don't, you lose backwards compatibility with the EVM, um, which obviously has a fair bit of infrastructure built up around it. Um, I, I've always felt that it, it hadn't achieved escape velocity for kind of all the reasons we just talked about with big companies and all these other things. And so it, it obviously is a, something you have to overcome. And, and it was not um, to be taken for granted that it would be overcome. Um, but at this point... Uh, if you look at the state of the Solana ecosystem, it's hard not to imagine basically all the things Ethereum has that Solana doesn't have today. So things like Dune, things like Graph, which is announced, you know, a few, a few more DeFi primitives and those things. It's pretty hard not to imagine in the next three or so months, those things all, maybe six, like all those things are getting built out and you're basically kind of future parity for what I'll call all the middleware DeFi primitive stuff. And if, and if you assume that's the case in three to six months, then it's like, okay, well, what advantage is the EVM actually providing now? Um, and, and that starts to become very, very um, insignificant pretty quickly. Right, okay. I mean, I agree about those tools, but just in general, it's not possible to put something like, I mean, not that, not that you would want to have Uniswap on Solana because, of course, Solana would support more efficient order book-based exchanges. But if there's a, a, an application in DeFi that the users like, what are sort of the steps to porting it over? I assume it has to, it requires a full rewrite, yeah? Yeah, full rewrite of the smart contracts, for sure. Um, one, one thing I, I've observed that I was wrong about was, you know, back in August, September of last year, you know, reached out to a whole bunch of the DeFi protocols, um, all the major ones, and was like, hey guys, you know, Solana's, you know, Serum was announced and there's a little bit of volume starting to happen. And Solana team reached out to all the major DeFi protocols on Ethereum and said, hey, you know, are you guys interested in rebuilding, you know, on, on Solana? And all of them said, they all were like, oh, this is interesting and cool. And then none of them did anything. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's been nine months now. And like, you can see that none of them have, have relaunched, um, you know, on Solana. Um, and so like the question is, is why? Um, obviously, they didn't think it was a priority. It, it's kind of implicit in that. But um, if you kind of dig beyond that, um, one thing I've observed having inter interface with a fair number of, of solidity based um, EVM engineering organizations um, is that they, the, the Ethereum developer teams have very little, if any, um, expertise building Rust, writing Rust um, mm -hmm. and, and deploying Rust. Um, and not that Rust is like a weird niche language. I mean, Rust is a, it's one of the most popular languages in the world now. Um, but they just, these teams just don't have that experience in house. Um, and, and so, you know, 
as an engineering leader, um, if you don't understand kind of this this other code base, the other technology base, and now you're tasked to go build some first 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 class application, um, it's just a very hard thing to do, both as an engineering leader and then also to find and recruit the team, you know, to do it. Um, and, and so there's just a lot of organizational momentum that um, existing Ethereum-based DeFi teams have um, that's not easy to overcome. So um, you know, the Solana team, I, I think, kind of realized, you know late last year that those kind of those efforts to try and get people to port over were failing. Um, I mean, they, I think the failure rate was hundred percent. Um, and, um, have realized, okay, well then we have to build everything new from the ground up with new teams, um, which feels like a risky strategy. Um, and, and it is obviously riskier. Um, but I don't actually think the amount of risk is actually that, that high on a relative basis. Um, and if you look today, you've got multiple teams building, um, Money market things like, like Compound and Aave, um, the, like Jet and Oxygen, I think are the two that I'm aware of. There may be others. Um, they you know, Jet and Oxygen are, are money mm -hmm. markets. Um, you've got teams building um, margin trading M Mango. You've got teams working, multiple teams working on perpetual contracts and, and quarterly futures. You've got multiple teams working on options. Um, so I mean, like th those are the, all the most important um, kind of core primitives. Uh, you've got teams already working on all those things. Um, and I think most of those, those market segments will be reasonably competitive. You know, there will probably be two or three major, um, players in most of those markets, which is healthy, right? Like you don't want there to be a single, a single protocol for each kind of core primitive. It's healthy for the market to have two or three. Um, and, um, most of these teams that I kind of just named are, are venture backable. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that we are necessarily investors in them, but they are all like venture backable teams. Can you say something about Serum? Y yeah. Um, you know, Sam was running FTX, and they obviously, it seems like DeFi clicked for them kind of in May or so of last year. Mm -hmm. They said, aha, like this is, this is important. Um, and they started to do stuff on Ethereum, and they, were just, they hit all the throughput constraints. Um, and they were like, we just can't do this. Um, it's just not gonna, we're not going to build a product that we want to be able to build. So they started looking around. Um, I remember I had a call with Sam and Anatoly. I want to say it was like on July 7th or thereabouts last year, something like that. Um, call started, at, it was 10 o'clock for me in Texas, 8 o'clock for Anatoly, um, and it was 11 a.m. for Sam in Hong Kong. And uh, call was set up for 30 minutes, went for two and a half hours, um, and kind of like just dove like really deep into, um, you, you know, like what, what did Sam want to build? Uh, I remember we had like a really like existential debate about like what is the nature of, of financial markets like information theory, like what's the speed at which things propagate? I mean, literally the speed of light, but then also like more importantly, like what is the time scale that matters for prices to update? Um, is it okay if the price updates aren't, you know, measured in nanoseconds, but measured in milliseconds? Um, and like what, what, what's the inefficiencies that creates, um, right? And, and like kind of very kind of existential questions about the nature of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of reason through all this stuff. And, you, you know, you could, I remember I could, it was obvious Sam's, the wheels were turning in Sam's head and he was like, yes, like 400 millisecond to one second time scale is, is a sufficiently low time scale that you can make this thing work. 15 seconds is too slow. It's unclear where exactly the threshold is between one second and 15 seconds, but, but somewhere in there is kind of the threshold to make this stuff work. Um, and, you know, he understood quickly that like, you need parallelism for this to work. Because he's like, yeah, like I'm going to have a bunch of serum markets and like obviously you need these things to transact in parallel, not in in... Um, not serially. Um, and so you kind of realize all that stuff pretty quickly over the phone. Um, and I remember I went to bed and then I, the next day I woke up and Anatoly texted me. He said, dude, someone's spamming the Solana network. And I was like, I was like, I bet it's the FTX engineers. And like, yeah, they started spamming the network that night to test it. Um, and like, you know, Sam got underway building Serum from there. Is Serum a, is an application or a suit of applications? Serum is a protocol. Mm -hmm. um, Serum actually does not have a front end today, at least not one that's like endorsed by Sam and the Serum team officially. Um, if you even go to projectserum.com, there's like a list of front ends that, that are there. Um, but, but Serum is, is not a protocol. I think probably the most interesting thing about Serum is that it is the opposite of FTX in so many ways. Um, FTX is obviously a full stack experience. Um, the UI is, is glorious, customer support, if you on ramps, all those things. Um, What's interesting is that, like, you know, FTX has been widely recognized for their product execution over the last two years, um, where they control the full stack. And it's been very interesting to watch the Serum team do the opposite for, 
for Serum, which is to say, hey guys, here's a protocol. Um, it enable it, it's a, a protocol that enables you to have order books and markets um, on the chain and ability to cross the spread, basically, right, and, and tr- complete a transaction. Mm-hmm. Um, and it only does that for spot stuff. Although you can use the order book infrastructure for theoretically any asset, whether it's it's leverage or derivatives or something else. Mm. But here's this infrastructure. Please go build other stuff around it. So build front ends, build margin trading, build perpetual contracts, quarterly futures, all these other things. Um, and at first I was kind of confused, um, kind of watching them do this. But, but it, was, it was, you know, like FTX is, is a very full stack, highly controlled thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Serum is not. And I just kind of assumed they were going to build Serum in the same way. That was just my default assumption. Um, and they've, if you look at the communications from the Serum Telegram, from the, or from the Serum Medium, from the Serum Twitter, um, you'll see they can, this continuous repeated focus on Serum as a development platform for third mm-hmm. parties. Um, where there is no official front end, um, and they're really focused on enabling other developers to build DeFi primitives. Um, this is like not particularly novel thinking in crypto DeFi land, obviously, but I, I think it's very interesting that you've got a single entrepreneur who is known for controlling the full stack experience on one end, also then having the, the wherewithal to say, we're going to engage DeFi in a DeFi native way um, mm-hmm. and not try and control the whole thing. Um, and I think that's been super interesting to kind of see that dichotomy play out. Yeah, thank you. That is indeed very interesting. Um, um, we didn't. We kind of moved away from the original question. We barely talked about sort of the the synchronous versus the asynchronous experience of DeFi, and instead talked about like how much decentralization is enough, how to measure decentralization, and and so on, and what you can get in return. And that, that was also very interesting. So. I would say thanks, guys, for the discussion. Uh, hey, Hasu, Sue, thank you for having me on. Pleasure to be on. I've been listening for a long time, and uh, yeah, it's cool, cool to dive into this stuff. I love the really deep first principles. Uh, you know, peeling back the onion one layer at a time. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Hasu. Thanks, Hasu.